All right, Kevin. Oh, man. Well, here we are, man. And we're going to go all the way. After minor, you know, technical difficulties, we're going to travel back to 1988 when you were um, in the director's chair of Cops, the animated series. Um, yes. Being that you were, you know, obviously you had worked on several animated projects before that when cops happened. Um, how did you get the call and were you, you know, were you ready? Were you already on board or were, yeah, well, I was, I was in house at, um, geek. And at that time, um, when cops came in, there was, you know, we, we'd been working with, uh, toy companies quite a lot, you know, at geek, that was kind of their thing. And uh, I was working on, let me see, second season of Real Ghostbusters. Um, speaking of toy shows. Yes. Second season of Ghostbusters. At the, and I was, essentially, I was the director. My title was, I was basically supervising all the storyboards, but I was really the director. And it was the same thing. I was doing the same thing on Starcom, which was a pretty intense show. And yes. Starcom was another toy show you know, toy motivated show, which we, and it had like great toys. And the thing that um, I really liked about Starcom at the time was that it was science fiction. And we were like really laying into it with the, with a accurate science fiction. Cause the Voyager was brand new back then, you know? Yeah. And anyway, so, uh, you know, I was working on those shows and elf at the same time. So God, you know, I was like, I was like busier than hell. <laughs> and then uh, about the time we moved to Burbank, Hasbro showed up with the, uh, this new toy line that they wanted to launch. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the toy line was going to be based on the character designs and the designs that were done for this show, um, which I guess is something that, you know, They'd been doing it. Was He Man Hasbro? I think so. No. He Man was Mattel. Yeah. He Man um, was Mattel. Hasbro was doing G.I. Joe. Yeah. They were doing the G.I. Joe, Joe. And they did. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. So the thing about this is we did this uh, three or four minute tr introductory trailer with uh, Bulletproof as the, you know, as the narrator. And that was done pretty much with uh, Lou Police and, um, as a character designer and just basically the guys off of Starcom. Yeah. You know, it was me, Dan Reba. I, I boarded the whole thing myself and, you know, did this whole thing, introducing the big boss and all, you know, all that. And we did that and Hasbro loved it. And I'll say this, it's like in future, I was actually working with Hasbro, working at Hasbro when they opened up their own animation studio years later, nice. years, years, years after this. And, I always got along with the Hasbro guys. I you mean, know? <laughs> because whenever you'd have a conversation on, about you know like what you're doing, because the thing that we had going for us is Hasbro wanted uh, action toy. You know, they, they wanted the vehicles, they wanted yeah. the characters doing their thing, and they wanted them to be you know action packed. They were action packed. I remember them having the cap gun. Each character came with the cap gun, so they yeah. had the little cap piece that came and you would pull the little trigger on the gun and it would do the little cap thing. But speaking of um, the whole atmosphere around cops, was there a unique concept that came with that, that y'all were looking for a particular vision based around the theme that you wanted it to go in? Cause it was obviously set in, you know, 2023 and it's, or 2020. Yep. In 19, 2020. In, yeah. In 1988, y'all moved it to 2020 with, a lot of the things that are prevalent today with the, you know, the Ray-Ban yeah. sunglasses, that's AR virtual reality world. And it was kind of cybernetic. So, yeah. Yeah. And the, then, you know, bulletproof being like, you know, basically a cyborg, he's like the one, you know, $6 million man. Yeah. You know, it's like that, that stuff was, um, that was all pretty new at the time. And yes, we were, we were trying to extrapolate like what, the future is going to look like, <laughs> you know, 
and it was based in we we're you know and we we're doing our basically it was kind of like we we're doing uh blade runner i could see you know, an animated version of blade runner I and i think the closest we came to it was because there there was uh let me see how many shows yes there was five syndicated shows they did this on ghostbusters too the same schedule five syndicated shows a week had to be done which i was supervising and I had to go over all those storyboards. And then there was the Saturday morning show, yeah. which was 13, um, starting with the pilot, which do you have the title? It was one with the blimp. Uh, the airship. The, uh, I can't remember the title. It's, uh, let's see, the first episode? Yeah, it was the first episode. All right, let's give me one second. I'll pull and it up. that one was like where we were really, you know, I had a big hand in storyboarding it, and it was like basically our A team was me, Dan Reba, Al Ziegler, you know, yeah, so Brad that, Raider. That was Case of the Stuck Up Blimp. Yes, Case, Case of the Stuck Up Blimp. <laughs> and um, yeah, it, I mean, you know, and then that that kind of told us because we were going very serious. And if people remember that episode, we had animating bullets. Yes, like in the Fleischer cartoons, and that, and that was, was like our attempt at doing Fleischer. Nice. It also had a, um, it had a pre Batman the animated series Neor feel in the background. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess we were trying. I mean, that that's where we were going. It was you know really we that was me, Dan Reba, and Brad. You know, at all just trying to do the Fleischer thing, which later on Batman the animated series we did much more successfully. Oh, most definitely. I uh, you know with that being, I mean, we're talking about animation in the eighties. It had its limitations and it had its charm. You know, when you look back at it, what was the technical challenges of dealing with that creative solutions that you just had to work with as a team to employ everything that was kind of fresh and new coming out based on toy sales? Yeah, well, again, the toy sales were never a problem. Hasbro, never a problem. They were happy. They like that first episode. Um, and, you know, um, Andy Hayward and um, just all the executives, and, you know, and Sun, and was it Sunbow, whoever, the distributor, you yeah. know, and broadcast standards, they were all over it. And I remember I had to call like a hundred, re- over a hundred retakes yeah. when the animation came back. And the overseas studio, who actually did quite a good job on that, I actually remember having the conversation with the head of the uh, studio in Japan, where, you know, through translators and stuff, where they're saying, you know, th- this, this amount of retakes is impossible. It's, it's impossible for us to do it. And I just said, look, just do the technical and, you know, this is behind the scenes. And I said, just do the technical retakes first. Yeah. Which many of which they would call themselves anyway. And I said, just do those first. Um, But, you know, and I just said, look, you think you're getting it bad. You should be in my shoes over here because it's like, they're, they're not letting up. Everyone's complaining. Everyone is complaining, you know? And I said, but the next episode, they won't be. Yeah. This is the pilot. It's the first one. Everyone's looking at it. Everyone's going to have their say. Correct. Speak- Lo and behold, they did those the technical retakes. So the show came out looking pretty pretty good, considering the low budget that we had. Well, um, and it's almost like they didn't even notice how many retakes weren't done. Wow. You know. They didn't. They didn't even notice none of the executives, and everyone was like pretty happy with the show. I mean, speaking of the um, except for the animating bullets, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, you know, I'm I'm really glad that that got through, especially in the big banquet sequence at yeah. the end. I think Brad Raider storyboarded that. <laughs> um, the, it really makes it. You know, it can make it kind of sells the whole thing. Just having the animating bullets. Uh, you'll notice that we never had those before. But that was one thing that I just did not want to do was like the G.I. Joe laser guns. Oh, yeah. The G.I. Joe laser guns, the Transformer laser guns. It was, 
yeah. Silverhawks laser guns. I mean, there were laser guns all over the place. I think that when you look back at the difficulties that you were having to deal with, you, you know, how did y'all as a team between Brad Radar, Dan Reba, who in their own rights are excellent, you know, storyboard artists, directors, and and, yeah. and so forth. Like, how did y'all stay inspired to continue pushing through with the deadlines and the, you know, the budget that was a small part, knowing that the season of cops was kind of looked at from season, from episode one as a lot of things that needed to be kind of added, reto- reshot, you know, take away from. How did y'all stay yeah. laser locked in and complete 65 episodes? <laughs> I mean, um, because I have no idea. <laughs> you, Honest to God, it's like, it's, I mean, just because I was working on this and then, you know, then Alf Tales came along, you know, and I was, I was working on that show and I had to concentrate on that. Uh, I really don't know. It's like, it's just, it was just kind of a whirlwind thing. And it's like, at that point I was kind of used to it. Yeah. You know, you just break that breakneck pace and, you know, and Peter Chung, you know, came on board. Uh, at Deke about that time. Yeah. Um, he just started there and he was, you know, and he did the whole character redesign. But the thing about Peter is that this was probably, I didn't, I did, I started doing the opening, but then Peter just took it over and he uh, just did his thing. But the thing about Peter is in record time, he animated the whole opening himself. That's, that's wild. And it couldn't be done otherwise. Not not with those wacky character designs that he has, you know. Yeah. And I can't believe they made toys out of those designs. Yeah. I mean, and they, you know, on the vintage side of the toy market, those toys are still some of the most sought after pieces of 80s or late 80s toy collectibles just because yeah. they were with the cap gun. You know, they had the little cap yeah. thing that was going. It was, was completely was different. Like- yeah, that was something that Hasbro insisted. I mean, Hasbro insisted that these are guns, you know, <laughs> like, because, you know, their whole thing was the cap gun. Yeah. You know, police use guns. And the lead character, the main character is bulletproof. You know, I'm, I, you know, and I had the arguments and it's like, there's the episode, the origin of bulletproof. Yeah. It's You've got to see the bullets ricocheting off of his chest. Chest. You yeah. got to see it yeah. because he's bulletproof. That's mm. the point. And you know, the arguments I'd make would you know BS and P would just be saying no, no, absolutely not. But I've got Hasbro on my side, so at least I had an ally there to argue the point because mm. it's ridiculous to have this character called bulletproof if you don't see it. You well, know, at some point, because it's a cop show, that's and the true. bad guys come in and they 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 plan on bumping them off. So that you really don't have that kind of that wasn't really done at that time. I mean, you're speaking Not since Johnny Quest. Not since Johnny Quest. Yeah, Johnny Quest was wow. That's a that's a throwback character. The um, when you're speaking of the characters like Bulletproof and what what inspired bulletproof i mean at the especially in that era of um animation every lead happened to be somewhat caucasian he-man was caucasian duke was caucasian oh. i mean you had yeah. you had gi joe speaking of gi joe you had larry hammer that tied in beachhead's dad to be in yeah. or Beachhead's son being in cops, his dad being obviously um, G.I. Joe, but the character development and the process of creating these, how was it that Bulletproof was going to be this centrical African American leader of this not ragtag group of cops because, you know, Mirage and Bowser and Longarm, all of them had their own fandom. It was like as a kid, you would buy you liked one of the other, and then you liked them all together. And the same thing with 
Dr. Bad Vibes and um, the kind of kooky um, bodybuilder looking guy and, you know, Big Boss. How did these characters come, just come to the table? Uh, they they came pretty much, I believe, the uh, the character lineup, because when I did the um, the promo, which was way before the show even got greenlit, um, the characters were all there. It's basically uh, bulletproof, like showing up and with dossiers of all the characters. Yeah. So all the main characters were there. Very, very typical of Hasbro. And I believe the names of the characters came from Hasbro. I got you. The designs were done at Deke, and then the toys were based on those. And, in, and the vehicles were based on, um, was it Steve Olds? You know, he showed up at Deke about that time. And, man, that guy was like a, I think he, I think he came from, uh, he's like a Sid Mead protege. You know, he took his class over at, um, you know, in college. Um, art center over in uh, over in Pasadena. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's where that came from. So those designs were, you know, I mean, I'd like to see those full scale. As we, and they actually look like Teslas, don't they? They do. <laughs> they're very, they're very similar to Teslas, and um, yeah, just almost like this Back to the Future kind of floating cars. But the yeah. when you look back on the era of like the eighties going into the nineties of animation, there was always this kind of moral lesson that the cartoon or animation would end with, you know, he man had their little this and GI Joe had this. And then it kind of went away with transformers, but in cops, the whole episode was a moral lesson. Like what you were yeah. you know, kind of what you were watching. They were as a kid, it blended the more it blended action it blended the moral lesson and then it made you want to be more a part of the story which mm -hmm. you would get the toy and then then you would create your own using your own imagination to build off of now look at what we can do you know i can take yeah. from case blah 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 and make my own with my own character base from what, as a kid, you're watching, you're kind of picking up from you guys' direction. How did that happen? Well, that's uh, strict. The, those are from discussions that I think um, was it probably Richard Rainis, Dwayne, my friend Dwayne Capizzi. He, um, you know, he was, he was in charge of the Saturday morning shows. Yeah. Um, and he wrote many of those um, himself. And it was basically conversations, I think, that would happen with the executives. So that was built in right from the get go. Um, that was that's it started with the script. I got you. You know, and it's not like you don't stop and give a moral lesson. Yeah, that's definitely. You know? Yeah, you definitely don't it's, stop. It just it. I don't yeah. know. It filled a void, and then if it didn't fill the void, it was in the end credits almost. Yeah. Well, it's in in each episode. Um, the thing each episode would have you would have a built-in, um, you know, the big, the big moment, which the whole show like leads to a climax. Yeah. You know, and you have, you have your big set piece and yeah. like the stuck up blimp <laughs> was, you know, big airship, you know, thing. And yeah. was it long arm with his, I think it was long arm with his, uh, fear of heights. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not sure. You yeah. know, so yeah. I think it was long. Arm. I think it was. And, <sighs> Was yeah. it long arm? I think so. I, I was watching that episode the other night where he's kind of caught between two yeah. buildings and he's sitting there yeah. and they're like, Oh, you seeing double? <laughs> yeah. The, yeah um, pretty good. And, you know, which, and, and we used a lot of, you know, a lot of Japanese animation techniques, you know, to get all that stuff. So it was like very, it was anime before anime. Yeah. You know, when we were working with the Japanese studios. Yeah, and uh, and uh, I mean, and then God, I mean, this one I did a lot of travel with this uh, this show. Yeah. Do you think? Um, do you think that the legacy of Cops has had a lasting impression on how um, animation has been influenced by that show in the industry? Um, because <laughs> because of the sci-fi genre, because of you know, 
I don't know about that, but it, it had it had an influence on the industry because the people, the crew that was on Cops, yeah, ended up at Warner Brothers, which ended up you know? Batman the Animated Series. Yeah, so it was like a lot of the same people, not just the crew here, but also animation wise, like a lot of the people that we worked with in Japan ended up like Spectrum was formed to do the pilot, uh, you know, on leather wings for Batman. Yeah. So it's kind of like the same connections. It's also the same connections on this show. We're also on Alf Tales and Alf. Yeah. So but, it was kind of kind of back then in the 80s, Deke's whole thing was keeping everybody busy. Yeah. Well, Deke was putting out product. so much stuff. I mean, it was yeah. almost like a testing market with Deke. They just would put out something. If it failed, they had something else coming out of the chamber. If it was successful, yeah. they kept going. If it was. Yeah. And this was very important to them because I know the broadcast standards complained about me. Because my my I was really really hands on on the Saturday morning episodes, which had a bit more budget to them and stuff. But you had I think it was a Sunbow, Sunbow was the distributor I think. Um, but the distributors were just mean. Yeah, you know <laughs> you can't do this. You know you can't do this, and I'm like, look. It's Hasbro show. They asked me to do this. They insisted on the gunplay. Well, we can't have any. And I'm like, well, it's cops and you uh, better talk to, you know, somebody. I can't, it's like, <laughs> I can't just, I can't, you're not just barking orders at me. You know, it's like, that's not going to work because I have to listen to these guys because they're putting up the money yeah. for the whole show. You're not, you're distributing it. They are the money. <laughs> it's like they have a lot of say, and they're making a lot of toys, and they want this show on the air, you know. So deal with it. <laughs> and, know, I mean, I, and in the meantime, and by the way, I got a I got a storyboard that I personally have to finish here. So uh, you know, bye. <laughs> yeah, I can't. It's like I can't get into these conversations all the time. Oh yeah, I mean, I get it. I completely they complained get it. about every every episode. Every episode, um, you know, it's like, I mean, it's like Jesus. What was the one with uh, Doctor Bad Vibes? I think it was with the giant clown head battering ram. Yeah, I vaguely you know? remember that. I think it was the this crime, is, the case of the crime circus. Yeah, case of the crime circus. Because yeah. Dwayne Capizzi, he wrote that one because Dwayne has a whole thing about clowns. <laughs> you know. Oh man, That's clowns scary are clown. Yeah, clowns yeah, no, are. Yeah, so that was like for him. It's like you know, it's like the clown thing is like a huge, huge thing for him. And they were saying, "Don't make it scary," and I'm like, "That's kind of a point." Yeah, it needs to be <laughs> scary. Episode. It's like the clowns got to be scary. So Who scared the kids. <laughs> I hope so. So you know, as we kind of get to the winding down point of this. There's just a couple more things I've got for you, Kevin. And it's, you know, cops has the, just the series in itself amongst kids that grew up in the eighties and the nineties, you know, it's continued to have um, just a lasting impact. Well, not only has it had a lasting impact on fans, but you've continued to have just an impressive resume of animation. I mean, from, Alf Thanks. to Transformers to Batman the Animated Series to Mask of the Phantasm to Scooby Doo to I mean it, the list just goes on and on and on and on. And how did directing cops influence your later projects for the things that you would eventually kind of be in the director's chair again and again yeah. and again for? Um well, cops, like I said, you know, there was like, it wasn't just cops, but there was like Starcom before this and uh, ALF and ALF Tales. Yeah. And basically we're, you know, it's like, it was a struggle that, yeah, we're doing it fast. Yeah. You know, it's, it's it, you know, Deke 
just needed it done as fast as possible, you know, and then the schedules were not enough. But that kind of worked in our favor because we could do the things we wanted to do and you figured out how to do animation with the resources we had, which is like yeah. very quick, cheap animation from Japan. And this is how you make it look good, you know, and we've got our chops down to make things look good. And then by the time we got, the, again, most of the same crew, Richie Chavez, you know, all these guys ended up over at Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers had a longer schedule. Yeah. <laughs> and we and all of the connections, all of the people in Japan that we met ended up being on um, you know, being on the show too. Yeah, doing the Warner so Brothers it's stuff. It's kind of like a continuation. It's a continuation. And I think finally with Batman, we got a chance to actually step forward, you know, and really do a good job. Awesome. Kevin, it's been an incredible journey, man, to revisit the streets of Empire City and to not only go beyond Empire City, but to get your insights on the process of how it came to be and how it was, you know, went from this to that. And it was just an illuminating, you know, story that you shared here today. And it just, it's always fun talking to you, man, about these old projects that you've worked on. Even Old, though, watch it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, well, I mean, you're still a youngster. You know, you're definitely still yeah, a youngster. No. But the like, just, just in my head. But it's <laughs> the, you look at the process of this stuff, man, and it's cartoons are nowhere near the same as it has. It doesn't have the same soul. It doesn't have the same vision. The same storytelling. It just doesn't resonate today's animation has no hold on the past as animation. It's just, I don't know, but um, you're a big part of all that past as well as present and future animation. And I can't, you know, I can't tell you it's such an honor to have you as a friend, but um, you know, I know that you're always pressed for time, man, but I thank you so much for taking the time to come on and, Share your experience no, no with, with cops, man. And uh, No problem. All right, Kevin, we'll, we'll be speaking soon, man. Much love. Uh, again, take care, brother. And do you have anything that you could share that you're working on? <laughs> <laughs> you have a secret out there, Kevin, that you want to, that you can kind of give well, just a hint of? Well, it's like I actually, I'm a... Uh, so, like in order to do a comic, in order to sell a comic to, uh, you know, I'll say to this one's to DC. There's two uh, comics that I'm actually working on. Okay. Uh, and they're, you know, dealing with, you know, characters that I love. Um, I can't really talk about it because it's not even been pitched. Nice. To, you know, yeah. <laughs> all I know is that they're. <laughs> that that you know, you know Jim Lee and you know those guys that I have to talk to, um, <laughs> you know they're waiting for me to tell them something. You know, I got gotcha. you. So I can't really talk about it yet because you know I've got to give it to them first. Understandable. <laughs> well, and they might tell me well, this is a bad idea. Okay, <laughs> then back to the drawing board, literally. Yeah. Well, I mean, I can't wait to see what it is. So. Kevin, it's always a pleasure, man. It's always it's always a blast talking with you, man. Have a have a good day out there in California and stay safe. You too. All right, man. See you, Mark. See you, Kevin.